All right. Anybody there? One person waiting. Oh, I have to admit people. All right. All right. We're getting people in now. Fantastic. Two book clubs and I haven't screwed up the Zoom settings <laughs> so badly that they can't happen. All right. Ooh, now, now I feel like I have lots of power. I can actually remove people from the, uh, from ah. the chat if I have to. Hey, Connor and John, come on in. Uh, you are mute right now, just in case you, uh, if you're attempting to talk to us. <laughs> Not to critique, but you're losing an opportunity by having it not in front of Dogman there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a valid point. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Not to critique, but I'm totally going to criticize something. <laughs> Hi, good evening. How are you? Great, how are you? Not bad. We're just getting everybody settled in. Yeah, We've no problem. Eight registrants and so far two people, but we'll uh, keep an eye on that. Actually, if you as we go through this, if you guys don't mind keeping an eye there, if somebody pops in, I don't want to yeah. make them wait for oh, too yeah. very long. All right. How are you doing? Me? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, thank you for asking. No problem. And John, we see your name, but uh, we don't see... Ah, oh, there we go. Hey! Oh. All right. Settle, settle down here. Looking very distinguished next to Dogman. In the background there. He's got a mask on. He does, actually, yeah. As does Waldo. Well, my kids are huge uh, Dogman and Captain Underpants fans, so I'm, I'm well acquainted with, uh, with the lore. How are you guys doing? Good. Friday? All, yeah, all things considered. Doing well. Can't complain. Excellent. All right. So I think we'll give everybody just a couple more minutes to come on in, and then we'll kind of go around the horn and do quick intros and you get to go there. I am overdressed. I haven't had an excuse to, to dress up for months and months. So here we go. This is me. Uh, just well, I feel almost underdressed now. Yeah, but please don't. I, I did this. This is just a treat for me to actually be like, oh, yeah, I should go with the suits I, I got. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brooks Brothers would appreciate you. This is actually, what's it called? Hockerty. It's an online ah. company. So yeah, it worked out pretty well. Probably have super shady business practices, but I haven't looked into it. So. <laughs> mm. uh, there's maybe one person who's going to make it to the in-person, but maybe, maybe she. I don't think she's going to make it. There was one woman who worked with us, but she has to babysit tonight. Uh, and the other woman has a dinner that was unexpected. You're stuck with us. I'm, yeah, I'm you're, good, with, you're stuck I'm good with, with you guys. Us. Well, so you know what's going on here. Here's what we got going on. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I didn't read the book, but I'm the bartender. <laughs> bartender gets free admission to every event. Unlicensed. <laughs> the best kind. I think I saw a wheat beer uh, kind of on the, on the lower side there a minute ago. Is it a wheat beer? Am I getting that right? Uh, hazy IPA, I believe. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're cooking dinner at the same time. <laughs> Connor, please don't feel the peer pressure. That is ever. No, nope, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to feel the peer pressure, that, that's that's fine. I think I think I might. I do have an open bottle of wine, so excuse me for a moment. <laughs> Not a problem. We, we'll give everybody a few more minutes just to turn up. I think it was this time last time too, like this oh, really? way last time too, where there was, you know, more people uh, than actually showed yeah. up, which is probably pretty typical. I'm glad I could be here for this one. Yeah, thank I mean, you. She made me miss the last one. Aww. There's a puppy in the back. Actually, we're falling down on the job by not showing you the adorable puppy who is accompanying us this evening. So cool. Is that Harper? It's Harper. Oh. So was that the store dog or Dr. Ward's dog? That's the bookstore dog. Bookstore dog. Okay. She's nice. Okay, oh, cool. Very nice. She just turned three months yesterday. Nice. <laughs> Little golden or? She's a golden. Golden. Cute. Yeah, my dogs are uh, 
they're at home still. We have one older dog and one puppy. And we were hoping the older dog would be the uh, the, mo the role model, but she wants nothing to do with him most of the time. She's, she's like a distant uh, urban aunt. She's like, oh, no, 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 you go you go play over there. <laughs> we think about that when someday we want to get another dog and we have our yeah, Aussie rescue here. So we're not sure he would be a very good teacher, maybe. He's not a good listener, so. <laughs> but Aussies usually make up for it with uh, enthusiasm. Is that yes, enough? yes. <laughs> Well, there's somebody else. I don't know. If, well, I don't know if they're wanting to get in or if they're just window shopping. All right. Good company, David. Well, maybe. <laughs> I think we can probably just get uh, get rolling. I don't see anybody else waiting to get admitted into the the Zoom. So thanks for being at the virtual meeting, and let's just do a quick uh, run around the horn and say who's who. So I'm Peter Ward. I teach at the Osteopathic School in Lewisburg, and I'm kind of an amateur nut for medical history because I find it both fascinating, inspiring, and horrifying in equal measure. And so I'm glad you guys are here to share just a little bit of that, of all three of those things, hopefully. And I'm Shay, I'm the bookstore manager. I'm Harper's mom. You all probably met me when you were at the store. Um, but I just love reading anything new or interesting. Hi, I'm David, bookstore owner. Hi, I'm Micheline, his wife, and unlicensed bartender. <laughs> All right. And how about you guys? Um, go around the horn. <laughs> I'm John. Um, my wife, I'm a student at the at the school. Uh, my wife actually read the majority of the book. I'm not sure if you got through it entirely. I didn't finish it completely. <laughs> I heard about the book club from the owners. I'm a nurse over at the hospital in the ER. Um, and I actually work part time at Humble Tomato, so that's when I heard about the book club. So they oh, yeah, just, now just, I know. You had a mask on when we saw you. Everyone's got a mask on. I know. <laughs> you just got me Humble Tomato pizza before this. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> before the Zoom the Zoom chat actually started. Um, my name is Connor. Obviously, I'm starting school at the med school. I guess in like two weeks, which is kind of crazy. I got to page 100 in the book, so I'm not quite done, but it's very interesting, and I really like it, so I'm definitely obviously going to keep reading it, but I love reading, and I just felt that this was a good way to, you know, get into the community, what with the social distancing and the quarantine, so. You guys are fantastic. I, I tried to market this as a low-effort book club, so if you didn't read the whole book or any of it, as long as you bought it, you got your ticket, and you're good to go. Good. We're good. <laughs> Awesome. Great job. So that's fantastic. And I think, David, you said you just finished it up. So. I did. I got maybe 50 pages to go. All right. And uh, you can't see David, but you can hear him. But I will steal his thunder a tiny bit. David has a very intimate connection with the subject matter of this book. Do you want to spill it now or uh, say it later? Why don't you sit over there? I think you can just sit over there. Press it over there. I'm one of the probably few living people now that actually managed to be put under with anesthesia. With ether, ether, right? Yeah. Anesthesia, yeah. ether. Ether of anesthesia. But uh, it was very a very bad experience, by the way. <laughs> it was about 1960, and I was having my tonsils taken out. And uh, I remember the room going around and around and around. And then the next thing I knew, I woke up and I threw up many, many, many times. So it, it was not a lovely experience. Hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> Otherwise known as your day in the ER, though, right? I was going to say, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's just that's one patient. You know. right. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> well, so, uh, so since everybody made you know, some or a lot of headway into the book, I guess uh, we can just do a free-form flow. I've got a fairly good handle on the story. I've heard of, you know, read several different books on it, and um, actually I've seen the ether device that uh, Morton used to actually administer ether at, uh, at the Boston uh, Hospital. So there's, it, it's just a fascinating story and I'm really glad we're able to read it because it, it's so great that surgical anesthesia happened, but the massive dysfunction of everyone involved is just so shockingly amazing. I think the, when I read this book and read through David uh, Morton, or not David, but uh, Morton's very checkered past as a con man it just blew my mind like anybody else just horrified at the chapter of him discussing his uh his, 
his work methods from going town to town? Everything. I feel like everything was just, I mean, everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's so basic. So, I mean, learning by mistake, but. Yeah. I was keeping kind of a running tab. It's like how many lines of credit he had open and how many yeah. businesses he had like fall, like, I don't know even what he did, but that was the, actually the last chapter I read just a little bit ago. So it's pretty fresh. It's kind of amazing that someone with that personality where he was kind of like conning people and stuff like that was able, I think because of his personality was able to be so brave as to do something like ether day. So I guess it's kind of, I don't know. I was like, well, this guy is obviously a scoundrel. They called him, but maybe it's because of that, that we have in it, that they had anesthesia at that time, which honestly, thank God, because when they were talking about the agony of the surgeries pre anesthesia, I was like, I wouldn't, I couldn't do it. No, nope, not even a little bit. Not be in the room, not perform surgery, nothing. So. Oh yeah, I mean, surgery these days, you can you could have an aversion to blood and still be a surgeon these days, depending on the circumstance, because it can be so meticulously well done. But yeah, back then it was just a matter of, it was just the wild west. I mean, everybody was going for as quick a surgery as possible, trying to make sure that it was, you know, they people were not exposed to the pain any longer than they had to be, but. Yeah, just the callousness that a lot of people developed is in regard to it. But I really think the thing that really sold Morton on it is just he was such an opportunist that when he saw a real opportunity, he, he recognized it. So I think, like you said, his, his uh, nature as a scoundrel kind of played into that because he was really able to lock on to that opportunity. Oh, yeah, that was definitely, yeah, opportunistic, I feel like is a really good word for that. There's, there's no other way. A positive word for what he was. <laughs> my personal favorite though is when he got circumcised in uh, preparation to marry the you know, the one uh, woman and before her dad found out that he was basically going from town to town ripping people <laughs> oh yeah and then he never paid for the surgery which was the oh. best part very on brand for him <laughs> it's, it's basically the punchline to his entire life prior to becoming a dentist pretty much i won't lie I think um, if he were alive today he could be president of the united states uh, I was thinking more about what his credit score might be. If we could get the dip it into the 200s and all like that. You'd have to go to Experian to raise it. <laughs> and then, uh, so going further, I think then you got uh, to Connor. Oh, no, it's the uh, Charles Jackson. He's the one that I think I'm even more fascinated with because his, his particular flavor of personal dysfunction to me is even more just ridiculous. Did you guys get? I mean, I did, did you, you said you're right. Yeah. yeah, just the sheer egotistical mania he had that anything he was involved with, he deserved all the credit for. It just blew me away. So he basically he said that Samuel Morris stole Morse code from him, and they didn't mention this in the book. Yeah. But other times he said he yeah. had the idea for TNT, and Alfred Nobel stole that from him. And then you know, then he claimed Morton stole anesthesia from him. It's just, just this pathological, I don't even want to call him a liar because I think he truly believed he was the one who deserved all the credit for these things just because he was an idea person who didn't follow anything through to a completion. Maybe a narcissist. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty, <laughs> I think except for Crawford Long, the, uh, the, the, the Georgia doctor, I don't, I think they're all fairly narcissistic in some ways. <laughs> Which, hey, I, I get, but you know. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to my narcissism in a way. There's a statue of Crawford Long at the Capitol. I think he's oh, yeah. the Georgia representative. In the oh, really? At the, in uh, at, in uh, the, ca the Capitol yeah. building in D.C.? In D.C. Wow. Oh, yeah, I think, I think it is Crawford Long. I actually want to go check that out now. Okay, a, I didn't know that. Crawford Long Hospital. In oh, yeah, it's huge, sprawling complex. And then in... When I was in law school at Emory, in the library there, they had a big Crawford Long exhibit. Hmm. I don't know if it's still there, but it was there, you know, a gazillion years ago. <laughs> I, I read this book before, but the one thing I didn't pick up until this reading was how many the how many states got involved in the controversy. I think what was it uh, New um, was it Connecticut that was pushing for Wells to get or New Hampshire, I think, was pushing for Wells to get the the honor and Georgia was pushing for Crawford Long. It was like it became a state's pride sort of a mm -hmm. sort of an issue. 
Well, I will, when I get to that part, I will let you know how, how, what I feel about that. But unfortunately I'm a little behind, but I did want to say about the whole Jackson thing. Definitely. I feel like narcissism played a role, but what's even like was really frustrating for me just to take it back um, was that he initially had criticized the laughing gas ordeal with Wells and then called it like humbug or whatever, or maybe that was um, Dr. Warren, but he was very, you know, openly negative about the whole idea. But then, you know, when it became successful and when they had talked on September 30th, him and Dr. Morton, like now he was like very much willing to take the credit for it and stuff like that. So I felt that was, I think all these people are opportunistic. I don't like any of them, if we're being no, honest. Crawford Long is the only one I think had, had, real, uh, had a real positive personality because the, uh, like Crawford Long, he, he was very grudgingly pursuing the, uh, the credit for it just because people wanted him to. But I think he just wanted to be a rural practitioner and kind of do well by his patients. And uh, yeah, Wells is the other one. I, I feel a little bad for Wells because he was kind of, he, he just wasn't, he didn't have enough of a forceful personality to push his own kind of his, his own capacity as the discoverer of it. And when he did, it kind of blew up in his face. And yeah, so I'm, I don't think uh, you got, uh, Connor, to the uh, the part where Wells died, but that is horrendous. So if somebody else wants to uh, give the outlines, I'll, I feel bad when I monopolize, but Wells' death is, wow. Anybody want to? On. I, I just got to that part. Like I said, I've got about 50 pages okay. to go. Oh. Putting everybody, put everybody on the spot, it's pop quiz time. <laughs> so he basically, did you want to go? Or? No, it's okay. You can go. So he, he, he got arrested. Yeah. addicted to chloroform because he was exploring that as a way to kind of redeem himself as the discoverer of anesthesia that he rented a you know, cheap hotel in New York. and. Aside from this book, there's other reports on what happened. Some people say he was set up, but essentially he got labeled as someone who was throwing uh, vitriol, throwing acid on um, women in New York, and he got thrown in jail. And knowing that his life was pretty much done because of the scandal, he had chloroform smuggled into him along with, actually, no, he, what was the deal? He, he was allowed to go back to his hotel to get some personal effects, and he got chloroform and a razor and he chloroformed himself and slit his femoral vessels and bled out in the in the jail. It is gross. <laughs> more, more <red> <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, he was the first one whose life was just pure ruined by this thing that uh, I'm trying to let me skip to the end. But there's a uh, Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the final paragraph, I think it's one of the best uh, mic drops in a piece of nonfiction I've read, but it's basically talking about how it just ruined the lives of Wells and Morton and Jackson and that. Uh, said, yeah, because they'd conquered pain, said the pain was not through, and with some sort of vengeance, pain itself turned sharply that day to conquer the men who dared to conquer it. Yeah, it pretty much just destroyed their lives, their own greed and their own just egotistical insanity. Happened. But yes, I think uh, still to me, Jackson's the one I just can't fathom. I'm just trying to get inside his head and figure out what what was this guy's life like where he would deride, like you said, he derides everybody's efforts because they're not as high status as him until something yeah. works, at which point he wants to wants to claim all the glory. Just I, I have no frame of reference for that kind of behavior. It's, it's strange. Oh. We have, a, we have a puppy, a, a <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought an interesting part of the book was the discussion about uh, the, the process of trying to patent the discovery oh, yeah. and how up until that point uh, in, in medicine, uh, it was thought that you shouldn't patent any of the processes uh, having to do with, with medicines and treatments at that point of time and I, th I thought it was very interesting and, and I thought it was interesting that they were sort of able to get a cat on it. Mm -hmm. It was not unique. It was not unique. Ah. I didn't think it was unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah it's, and it's a real 
the shift from today because we're used to medicine and money being considered together, but then money was considered to be beneath medical practitioners in a way. Like they weren't, it, it was undignified for them to seek after it or try to do things that would reward them monetarily, although obviously they still needed to pay their, you know, pay their rent and live. But uh, yeah, that, that boat has sailed today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that ship is sailed. Yeah. Good time. Good time. Yes, the uh, another thing that just I thought was amazing is because they had the uh, patent on it, but they had to so they had to try to find a way to disguise the fact it was just ether because you can't. They knew you couldn't patent ether because it had been known for you know, hundreds of years. But the fact that it had been known for hundreds of years, I'm trying to think what they said. There were people shortly after it's discovered, said, oh, by the way, somebody should try this uh, to numb pain during surgery. And like hundreds of years went by and no that, one Oh, sorry to cut you off, but no, that was, you know, aside from Dr. Jackson being the way he was, the fact that they had used like nitrous oxide and then used ether and at parties for like this fun drug. And then people were like, yes, it, I couldn't feel any pain. I'm stupefied. And then no one, you know, had taken seriously some of like the offhanded remarks like, oh, this might be good in surgery. It, it was just like kind of frustrating when you think about, you know, like how many people were undergoing these agonizing operations and they had, they had it right in their hands, but you know, they didn't have like Dr. Morton or any of these crazy people to really push for it. But it, it's just kind of crazy. It kind of makes you wonder what else are we sitting on that's not being used to its maximum like efficiency, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and, and none of these people were surgeons. I mean, so they were all outsiders, which I, I think part of that might be that they had a sense of learned helplessness. Nobody mm. was looking for it because nobody was really experimenting with it because they figured like, well, this is what surgery is. And they just, yeah. it was not in their mind as a thing that could actually be done. Although I think John Collins Warren, the surgeon who did the uh, nitrous and then later the ether um, surgeries, I think he comes off really well and I think deservedly so because he was an old guy. He was the authority. It would be very simple for him to just be, you know, just, just status quo and not even let people in to potentially make a mockery of one of his procedures. But he seemed to be very open to trying new things, which was a real I think it was a real boon, especially at that time. Oh, yeah. I think, you could, I think I haven't been there. Well, I've been there, but I haven't been in the room. But I think you can still go to that surgical suite where the ether day actually occurred. I, oh, think, it's, cool. I think it's still there at, uh, at Boston General. Okay. Actually, if you go there, there's a, uh, there's a huge painting of ether day. I think it's actually the, yeah, I think it's the picture that's on the front. I think that picture, there's, it, there's just this huge canvas when you go there. So I think that's where the original is. But my memory's a little faulty. It could just be a very similar picture. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of something else that had a similar type of invention, I suppose, that, that was useful. And I'm not coming up with anything of any real consequence that I can think of. Maybe Velcro? That was invented by NASA. I know. But, you know was, or, or aliens, depending <laughs> on, who's, right. on whose theory you uh, yeah, subscribe to. Yeah, no, I'm just to. trying to come up with it. I, I, I do remember that allegedly the head of the patent office in like 1897 resigned because he said everything of any significance has already been invented. Yeah, that... That attitude comes up every so often, and it's always shown to be horrendously wrong. So, <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, yeah, the, uh, the the book we're planning to do next in a few weeks, or you know, in probably six to eight weeks, is uh, a very similar book, but it's about how the other big barrier to surgery was broken down, and that was actually coming up with antisepsis and finding ways to deal with that. Because one thing they they don't dance around in this book; it's just the focus is that. Pain was only one of two major impediments to surgery being practical. The other one was just the fact that people would die regularly because of the filthy conditions, the lack of understanding of germ theory, or any concept that you had you were transmitting disease by touch. 
And once you opened up the skin, you know, it was playtime for any bacteria that made it in. So the next book we'll be doing is called uh, The Butchering Art. And it's, man, it's good. oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> the author's hilarious, too. The cover he, is great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I'll also not info on that. And if uh, if you find this to be entertaining, we'll make that one even more so because it's, <laughs> it's far more gruesome. The people involved are much nicer, but the, the actual yeah. story is, is more gruesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that because just you know, like you said, it wasn't the main focus, but they alluded to some uh, like you know, they would polish the handles of these surgical instruments, yes. but the blades weren't cleaned. And then it was a status symbol for a surgeon to have this really gross, like, apron on. I'm like, this is, that's alarming. Of course, you know, it, it, it was what it was. But I'm like, once I got the pain thing under control, I'm really excited to see them, like, get a handle on, you know, sterilization of everything, because that was... Yeah, and I, I made sure I, I wanted those two to go in succession because it links together just so nicely. Because yeah, it was really two things that stopped surgery from being taken, you know, seriously as a as a science. And the other thing that when I do a so uh, Connor, you don't know this, but I think uh, others do. When I at the beginning of each school year, I try to do a series of six talks on the history of medicine, just a kind of a an overview. And what's amazing is up until about 150 years ago, surgeons were not high status people at all. Like these days, if you used to tell your parents that you're qualified to be a surgeon, they'd probably be happy. Back then, that would be like, oh, guess your other plans didn't work out. Okay. <laughs> so the uh, surgery really kind of languished because it didn't have a thorough back, backing in you know, anatomy. And then even after surgeons knew what was there, they didn't know how to control the pain. They didn't know how to stop the raging infections that happened. And once those things happened, we basically jumped to having modern surgery within about a 30 year span. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah. And uh, you're talking about the filthy robes that the guys would wear. Another description I read about that period that just kind of made me gag was, uh, I guess one surgeon's knife got a little bit dull in the middle of an operation. So he had leather soled shoes. So he just kind of put his foot up and kind of <laughs> stropped his knife at the bottom of his shoes. <laughs> to keep on going with the uh, operation. That stuff is really... Like the ER, just like the ER here, right? You guys, <laughs> you, you guys are muted, by the way. So we do, you know, we're, that's how we do things here. It's, it's the same, you know. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I still hope you yell at people if their hands kind of start... Yeah, you know, I don't walk around in my dirty scrubs. I'm not proud of, like, a dirty blade. Yeah. <laughs> that's good stuff, but I am interested to know like kind of you know the talks about the history of medicine because you know surgery not being regarded as you know kind of the premier medical specialty was surprising even just reading it in chapter two where they're talking about you know surgery was the last resort you kind of had to accept that you know people aren't happy about it obviously you know you have to be a certain type of person to be a surgeon and perform these gruesome operations on people and that people, you know, like they didn't, they, they really weren't happy about it. And that was just, you know, not that anyone even now is happy to be undergoing surgery. But they're usually but not the fear of it. People elect to do it and they want to. I mean, look at our culture now, the people who want to go through, I mean, plastics is a huge area in itself. And I mean, the money that people put towards wanting sure. to have surgery. So that's, it is. It's a very interesting dichotomy. Yeah, but I mean, when, uh, when you give your uh, permission to have the surgical procedure done, you're always told, hey, there's a risk that you could die. But that's not something people really have in the forefront of their mind anymore. Whereas back then, it was like, I'm probably going to die. Right. Maybe I'll pull through. And, and that shift's just amazing. I think mean, it's the yeah. same with OB-GYN. I mean, childbirth used to be, yeah, it was a real coin toss. And nowadays, it's very rare. I thought I closed my email. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, just the unhygienic conditions, that's something we'll hit really hard. But uh, I don't know if it was in the part you got to, Connor, but the, there was one description of a patient who lost his nerve at the beginning of the procedure and like locked himself in a room closet and the surgeon yeah. kicked the door down and dragged him back. Like, yeah, he was like, you're doing it. You're doing it no matter what. It's nuts. I thought, Where, I thought it was interesting also that when, when they were going to do surgery, 
they always wrote in the records that the patient asked them to do the surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of kind of what happens now where you, where you are rushed into the hospital and you, you sign all of these consents, you know, as, as they're taking you to surgery often. And, and it's, you know, the consent to do anything they want to do to you. So uh, that's because of people like us. Yeah. We want those consents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because when you read, so my, I have a minor in history and uh, with sort of a concentration in American history. Mm -hmm. And I've read several books in the Civil War and you read about the medical treatment there. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I did a lot of skimming um, because it was so horrifying. Well, the thing that I didn't appreciate until I read this book the first time is you hear about Civil War battlefield surgeries and how brutal they were and oh, awful, yeah. but they had anesthesia just not available. So that's even worse. It's like, yeah. oh, yeah, they discovered that anesthesia worked, but there was no way to get it to the front lines. There's no way to get it to people in these field hospitals who needed it the most. And like they described in, you know, you know, it, well, various Civil War things. It was in Lincoln, the, the Spielberg movie, where they had just, like, piles of legs right. behind these tents and things. Were, yeah, we, yeah, we have a book of um, Matthew Brady photographs mm. from the Civil War, and there's all kinds of nasty there. Again, a lot of skimming. Um, but it was just horrifying to think what these people went through. But, and, you know, to their and credit, the surgeons lived. at least tried to be fast. They did. Yeah. They were quick. But, and the, the, it's astonishing to me that people live. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what gets to me is that people live. Oh, yeah. Well, they, they had to live through the procedure. They had to live through the healing process with no pain. And medication. any kind of infection, you know, from the yeah. shoe guy. <laughs> I, just, well, you see, I, I thought I was tough because when I had my ACL replacement done, my only post-surgical meds were a leave. So I thought I was tough. You know, at least I had a leave. <laughs> <laughs> like, go That's all you need. Come on. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Pops and ibuprofen. We're good to go. Get jogging, buddy. <laughs> so so what, what is the next big advancement in medicine do you think that's going to be the game changer? A game changer. Yeah. A vaccine. No. <laughs> I, that, that's my short term. Uh, yeah. oh, oh, couldn't quite hear you there. I say I don't want to bring up COVID, but I feel like that's um, you know everyone's TVs and phones every day, and that's what it's going to be something with that. Um, yeah, no, I think the uh, or antibodies or for that is yeah my my pipe dream. Are you guys familiar with uh, CRISPR? Have you heard of CRISPR? Yeah. How about you guys? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm but, yeah. You want to take it? I feel like I monopolize these things. Whoa. Basically, gene modification, more or less, right? Yeah, exactly. So CRISPR, it's a it's an enzyme that you can use to selectively edit DNA, and it's something they found in bacteria that they were able. To, bacteria use it to fight off other bacteria, so they kind of chop up their DNA. But they've discovered ways to take tumor suppressor genes from other animals that are far less prone to cancer and maybe insert them, and it's a way you can literally edit. DNA, instead of just inserting stuff randomly, it can literally be edited, which comes with all the benefits and also potentially downsides that you can think of with gene editing at that level. But yeah, I think CRISPR is going to be the next big thing. I think the first clinical trial of a CRISPR treatment just happened last year. Wow, wow that's, a, that's a lot of um, ethical. Oh, yeah. Bioethics or whatever it is, ethical. Now, speaking of ethics, and we can get back, but did you guys read the quote about the uh, the bishops who were uh, a little upset about the use of chloroform in England? Did you get? Did you guys get to that part? No, unfortunately. Oh, no, bad book club member. Sorry. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Please, I, I I really want this to just be something we can all talk about, and whether you get all the, the reading done or not, really is kind of uh, incidental, but the, uh, when Ether made it to England, it was an immediate hit. A really prominent surgeon, a guy named Robert Liston, adopted it right away. And uh, the, actually, the, the quotations in here just kill me. So first off, what was the, uh, what was the damning thing that got yelled at the, at the, oh, at, not Morton, at, uh, at Wells. So Wells got uh, ridiculed by the medical students, and I think Humbug was the most damning 
awful thing they yelled at him. I think I think Humbug needs to come back. Humbug needs to know. Humbug, he, he needs Humbug to should make a return. Yeah. But then in a year when Ether worked, they said, gentlemen, this is no humbug, which I thought was maybe <laughs> the quote of the book, but I was wrong. I'm going to bring that back to the ER. I'm going to use humbug in the ER. I'm going to bring that back. It's like, <laughs> whenever somebody makes a mistake, just yell humbug at them and see what happens. <laughs> like, get out of here. In school, you got to out. There we go. Okay. <laughs> that'll, maybe that'll be my way of singling people out for especially bad answers. It's like, humbug, sir! <laughs> there you go. That's better, than, that's better than law school professors. Uh, oh, what are the law school professors like? Uh, public shaming. Okay, so it's, <laughs> is it beat you down verbally until you cry, or just beat you down to a certain point? Favorite, beat you down to a certain point. It's my, just public shaming. My favorite law school story, which may or may not public be shaming. true, is that the professor called on a law student to give an answer to a case, as they, as they say, and then the, the professor started belittling the guy, of course, as, as they do all the time. And the guy got his books, and, and uh, the professor said, you need to just leave my class. Oh, geez. So the guy got his books up, and he started out, and he turned around, and he said, sir, you are a son of a bitch. And the <laughs> professor said, Come back and take a seat. Maybe I was too quick in judgment. There we go. All right. <laughs> There's a lot of public shaming in law school. It's, oh, it's really miserable. Yeah, med school is about pimping, not so much, not so much <laughs> oh, shaming. Oh, pimping. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, would, would you care to define pimping? I mean, have you been on the receiving end? Of, uh... I haven't had it directly, really. Well, my understanding of pimping is basically just being asked multiple questions in succession that you're probably not going to know the answer to. So it's it's shaming, but it's more of an impersonal shaming. They just oh. ask questions until you break somebody. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And there really needs to be a better word than pimping. Pimping has too many other. <laughs> I was thinking that's what it meant. No, that's I what was, it, that's what they call it, but it's a terrible word. For yeah, it. I was thinking that was like something else. That was I think it should on. be called planing. Yeah. It's like when you plane down a piece of wood. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, just, when you plane it, you plane it. it just, you can't plane it anymore. Oh, it's, wow. it's, there you go. A little bit of wood is a bit of the soul of that student that you're scraping. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah. it's coming. <laughs> oh man, but the uh, uh, so we were talking about. So is the evolution that, of medicine is it really just trial and error? It it's actually worse than trial and error because one thing that we didn't get to at all in this book is the pre 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 history of medicine like this, and it was just stasis for a millennia. Basically, there's a there was a Greek doctor named Galen who lived in Roman times. So he was around 200 AD. Sorry, no. Yeah, around, no, that's right, about 200 AD. And he wrote things so persuasively and so comprehensively, people said, oh, Galen figured it all out. And if we did, Galen didn't talk about it, Aristotle did. And so people just took them as the definitive word for 1,200 years. So basically, medical practice was essentially recreating and parroting back whatever these guys had said. And it wasn't about exploring or innovating or doing any experiments. It was just about being textually correct. And if the patient makes it, awesome, you're a great doctor. If the patient didn't make it, oh, evidently he had too much black bile in his system. We should have bled him more. more yeah. So it, yeah, it's worse than trial and error. Trial and error was an improvement over the stasis that we had for millennia. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, and you could also say trial and error is science is trial and error. It's just science, a very, it's, well, yeah. it's a very formalized version of it. So yeah. no, science yeah. is trial and error, and I understand science evolves and things change. It's just if it's trial and error by you know chopping someone's leg off, that's one thing. If it's trial and error by you know something else, that's something else. <laughs> we have we have a good book here in the store on uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush. Mm. Uh, that I, I haven't read that yet. I would recommend that anyone read that. I have it both from a. A medical and then a political standpoint, but it, it amazed me that he was the like premier physician during the time, and he was so into bleeding that obviously it ultimately killed him. But that that was his cure for pretty much everything was bleeding. Oh, so I remember where we were. I was uh, thinking about earlier the. Um, the surgeons in Europe got a hold of, hello. Oh. They're not coming for us. 
the surgeons in uh, England, especially after Robert Liston tried out uh, ether and it was a success, he had, I think, an even better quote. He, in, it wasn't even humbug. He said, gentlemen, this Yankee Dodge beats mesmerism hollow. Now the translation for that, it's Yankee Dodge means this American innovation. Yeah beats mesmerism. Mesmerism was early hypnotism. It was actually founded, the guy named Franz Anton Mesmer came up with this system that used what we would call hypnosis. Now, he had this whole intricate explanation for it that was complete crap. He was another interesting one because he had a really amazing discovery, but his attribution for why it worked was completely off base. And he was unwilling to reconsider other options for why that worked. But they were able to induce hypnotic states in people and do surgery, but the prep time was hours to days. Yeah, they said it took like a full 24 hours to hypnotize them to get them into the state that they preferred for surgery, so. Yeah, not many hypnotists employed in the ER, I don't think. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So David, and David and I have certainly both had surgery, different levels of it, but I wouldn't want a hypnotist. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll take the ether over. Yeah, I want somebody <laughs> like with little mouth. I'll, I'll throw up. And, uh, if I have <laughs> yeah, throwing up is okay. <laughs> yeah, and then so uh, another guy, James Simpson, was the uh, one who then looked for things other than the ether. He came up with chloroform, which was much, it was even more potent. It was more easily regulated. And uh, the thing I really was amazed by was, we were talking about the ethical side of it, is it was considered to be unethical by some people to lessen the pain of surgery or lessen the pain of childbirth because it was considered to be a biblical injunction that women should suffer through childbirth and that, you know, you're, you shouldn't, you know, you, you shouldn't undo this pain because obviously it's there for a reason. The thing I think is amazing is after James Simpson gave Queen Victoria uh, chloroform for one of the, one of her children's births, no one said anything. <laughs> so oh, really? as, as soon as the queen was good with it, everybody the line very very quickly now not to divert the subject but i don't know if you ever watched the crown on netflix i remember them showing that queen elizabeth used was it nightshade for her births they gave her nightshade or ether during all of her births for her children so i thought that was very interesting i never fact checked that that seemed a little out of um the era but well, I'm trying yeah. to think of nightshade like nightshade so the late 60s because so prince philip uh, I mean, yeah been... I think, like nightshade is what it was a drug that we derived from it. it's a uh, blood thinner so i don't know why they'd give her a blood thinner it was something else i mean that's what i mean i'm not sure how accurate that was but i remember like going back to that show kind of thinking about how accurate that was but in that era that you know especially the queen giving birth it needs to be better for her I guess not better. That's not a good choice of words, but oh no! But she got uh, she got royal treatment, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm I, okay. I'm. Uh, go, go for it. Oh, I was gonna. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I was gonna say I'm definitely no history buff whatsoever. But wasn't there kind of like a like a divine right type thing? Like these rulers were said to like be like chosen by God or something like that. So I wonder if like that was the whole thought process behind the chloroform being accepted after the queen, the queen decides to, I, I mean, I really don't know. I'm just. Yeah, that, that, that wasn't quite as prominent by then. Victorian London, really? a bit more progressive, but uh, yeah, I mean, the idea that rulers were chosen by God, it was always there in the background. And actually, have you ever heard of scrofula? It's a skin disease. It's, oh. it's not one we hear much about these days, but it was, you know, pretty, pretty pervasive and the for in the medieval and renaissance era it was thought that the touch of royalty could actually cure scrap loss so kings and queens would actually hold days where they would like just touch the heads of their you know of, of their subjects and uh, supposedly give them the royal touch and it would cure scrap law and you know i don't think anyone well yeah no one got cured because of that <laughs> it really shocked more monarchs get so how are we in the process <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, the divine right of uh, kings and queens, it was a real thing, but it, it had kind of fallen. People were a little more rational in, in the Victorian era. They were a little more, a little, little less willing to do that. Of course, by then, the, the English had knocked the heads off a couple of the monarchs prior, so I don't think they were, you know. They, they were, weren't 
really concerned about that. I don't know. Like I said, just a thought. But one thing that I was like kind of, you know, I wonder how many of the advancements of medicine were just, you know, purely random chance. Like this, you know, Dr. Wells or Wells, you know, going to that, you know, um, what was his name? Who did? Yeah. He just happened to go and that man happened to get hurt and he happened to realize that, um, you know, his knees weren't hurting and he happened to be in a position to make that, you know, a reality like with the nit- the nitrous oxide operation and, you know, how much longer would it have gone unnoticed if, it, if all these things hadn't happened, you know, seemingly randomly. So that was pretty interesting, I thought, and I wonder how many similar things have happened that have led to these, you know, these breakthroughs. Well, the horrifying thing to think of is how many uh, lost opportunities have there been that we still don't even know about. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's the, the history of medicine. There's a lot of examples of things like that, that were just random, seemingly inconsequential observations that turned out to be a big deal. Uh, one example would be Edward Jenner was a country practitioner in England and he was, you know, just talking to the patients and they said, oh yeah, milkmaids don't get smallpox. Like, mm-hmm. oh really? Because they got, they almost always got cowpox, you know, because they would milk cows, the cows had cowpox and they'd get it, very mild infection. But he actually said, huh, and started, uh, instead of infecting people with smallpox, which was actually what was done at the time. Quick aside, one reason I think that the Revolutionary War worked for us was that Washington actually had his troops inoculated with smallpox crusts. So what they do is they take the crust of smallpox and scratch it on your skin. And most of the time you develop a very mild reaction and you'd be immune to smallpox, but occasionally you'd get smallpox and you'd die. But they found out later that cowpox had that same protective quality, but if you got a full blown case of cowpox, you might have a little bit of scarring. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, right. that's an example of a seemingly minor observation that turned out to be tremendous. And there's plenty of other ones where people were like diligently working on a problem and finally hit on it. So, like yeah. there's a book called Radium Girl. Yeah. And it's about radium that they used to paint the faces of watches with. And just like the laughing gas parties, they would the girls after work would paint their nails and paint their teeth and they would all glow in the dark and they thought it was such a cool thing. And then years later, if that, they all had these similar symptoms and died from Did they get blood blood cancers usually? Was yeah, that what it was? They usually got the cancer and it's just amazing how many girls did it before they realized anything was an issue. Oh, yeah. I mean, back when radiation was first discovered, it was just a party trick. Yeah. I, mean, I think uh, there's a, I haven't been there, but I've had it described to me. There's a medical device museum in Minneapolis, and they have everything there in working condition. And one of the things they have is they used to give shoe stores these x-ray machines that you would stick your feet, you'd put the shoes on, then you'd stick, you'd stand on the machine, and it would, you'd turn it on and it would x-ray your feet in real time and you'd see how they fit in the shoes. But meanwhile, you're just being blasted by a massive dose of radiation while it's going on because <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't checking on exposure or anything like that because it was just a toy to them at, at that point. Wow, that would be like very handy though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, glad, I'm glad to say I've never had to buy shoes that required a, uh, an x-ray. <laughs> perfect work. I live in Minneapolis and I bought shoes there, so I'll have to look at where I bought them. <laughs> <laughs> You're buying shoes in a medical history museum. I have other questions for you. <laughs> All right, touche. <laughs> oh, the other thing that came up, I think uh, Connie mentioned, the guy who did the laughing guest party was Colt. It was the guy who invented the Colt 45. Like, was- yeah. I didn't catch that at all. The first time I read this book, and I was reading this, I'm like, wait a minute, the guy who invented Samuel Colt? Colt? Samuel Colt got his start mm-hmm. doing laughing gas parties. Yeah, and he, it was kind of funny, it wasn't, he was a, um, he was like a medical student, am I confusing it with another person? I might be, he was a medical student, but he didn't have money. And a gunsmith? <laughs> yeah, he had, he had like a U.S. patent, maybe it's a different person, but he had like wanted to get, like wanted to make money to go back to med school, and then... No, I think I've confused some people sure. here. Yeah, once he got, it seemed like the laughing gas was just a means to an end for him to get other projects going. Mm-hmm. Like the revolver. 
which, you know, made him fabulously wealthy. So that was a win for him. <laughs> yeah, so. Maybe not for anyone else. But. Well, yeah, I mean, at the time, they, it, was, it, it was marketed as the gun that settled the West, yeah. which, you know, sounds badass and amazing. Like, oh, that just means they shot lots of indigenous people. So, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. yeah. My, now, now modern, I'm, from, I'm from Oklahoma, so we got to tread lightly. No. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, yeah, modern, that's what it means. The modern interpretation is not the heroic version that we were no. raised on. No. Yeah. Yeah, the. Uh, oh, I'm trying to think. There's a. There's a piece. So. But do you think oh, that the ethics of the practice of medicine. I mean, because there, there are so many horror stories in the practice of medicine, you know, you know, the trial and error part, the Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. different things like that. I mean, is there, is the, the ethics of medicine, is that a bigger deal? Oh, it's a much bigger deal. I think, uh, and feel free to chime in, but I think we really do a lot of ethics content integrated in the curriculum of medical schools throughout the curriculum yeah i mean the fact that ethics is a consideration as a separate topic is a bit of a win in itself because i mean professional ethics back in this era was basically don't steal patients from other doctors yeah you know that was that's about where it stopped although i guess the I, i'm being a little bit mean to them because they were not trying to you know there wasn't as much of a profit motive right. at work but right, right right no i think it's the ethics of medicine i think is trending upward because people consider it heavily and there's a lot of well like you were talking it. about like yeah. the CRISPR thing mm -hmm. oh but I think every new invention that that ethical glide kind of takes a little bit of a dip and then kind of comes back up and okay. because okay. The, the excitement of a new innovation rightfully you know gets people interested in using it as widely as they can and sadly we don't know what the pitfalls are until yes. afterward so it's it's a it's a little tightrope I think because if you are so tentative that you never try, you've got you to try. Lose, yeah, you lose lots of opportunities. But if you're super cavalier about it, you're going to cause more, more, more damage harm than, than good. You, yeah, more harm than good. Exactly. Yeah, I, I was thinking when I was reading the book that before Anastasia, they were talking about you know, it was sort of a win if your patient didn't die. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I was it, it crossed my mind that when did we get to the part of do no harm oh well i mean if you want to i mean you, you can take do no harm back to hippocrates so that's going to be like 500 yeah. bc okay. but uh, i was thinking it was somehow related to the uh, the use no, of it's in that oath thing uh, okay. it's in that oath thing hippocratic yeah <laughs> I, i've heard of that somewhere yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we have the we, osteopathic we, oath here it's slightly different yeah yeah yeah, yeah you know we don't have that in the law. <laughs> You're like, do harm, whatever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> do your best to do no harm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll couch it that way. Or something like that. <laughs> don't get caught doing harm. There you go. I like that. <laughs> Not what you got. Uh, <laughs> I need to go to law. <laughs> I'm a to the law. <laughs> The one uh, one thing that I thought was kind of a neat aside that I didn't really draw much out of, but is kind of intriguing, is on uh, page one thirteen. Don't feel like you have to flip there, but the uh, one of the people who had kind of uh, been brought in to officiate early on when uh, ether was discovered to have this property of surgical anesthesia was again an Oliver Wendell Holmes. So he was kind of Boston royalty. He was a um, he was a medical he was actually a professor of anatomy at Harvard, but the amazing thing is he was more well known as a columnist. He had a week at a day I think it was a daily newspaper kind of column called the uh, the the autocrat of the breakfast table. It was just basically him you know propounding whatever topic he wanted. But he was read by the entire country. He was this massive in, you know, influencer in that era, and he was brought in to kind of talk about the uh, anesthesia and he gave it suggested the name anesthesia instead of lethion but the thing that they didn't bring up in here he came up with antisepsis earlier and dropped it and yeah he got busy with other stuff but he came up with antisepsis knew its significance and he had a paper he had a column in every newspaper in the country for decades his son became a supreme court justice i mean this guy had the platform 
to push that agenda, but he didn't. So we were talking about missed opportunities. I mean, this guy could have just said, hey, that thing I thought of 20 years ago, we should try that again. And I actually have the, <laughs> I have the wherewithal to do that. <laughs> But what, are, what are we missing right now? What's out there right now that we're missing? I love to think about that. You know, what's if, if anybody wants to send a time capsule forward 20 years and report back, I'd be in your debt. Cause... Yeah. I think uh, my take would be autoimmune stuff. Now, obviously, cancer, there's a lot going on. The cancer is so multifactorial, though, but I think the immune system and how environmental insults affect it, that'll probably be something another 100 years will be like. Can you believe they were doing whatever and thought they could just do that endlessly? Don't they know that that's going to destroy your T cells? And we just don't know. But I think uh, I'm, I'm betting autoimmune and allergy stuff will be something that we find out a lot more about in another hundred years. And those, our future, uh, our, our descendants will look back on us and shake their head when they think about what we're doing to screw up our immune system. You like to think that everything's gracefully discovered, but it really is. Oh no, it's fits and starts. And I think one thing that was, I think looking back to what Connor said or earlier is the, uh, you know, you needed somebody who had that showmanship and that ego like Morton to kind of bring this about. Because another example of that is Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur discovered some amazing stuff, but he didn't just discover it and that was it. He was, he was relentless and he was a really good showman and he was a really good speaker. And he made sure people understood the significance of what he did. So I think the, uh, yeah, again, I'm jumping to the next book, which by the way, is about the, the butchering art. <laughs> but the, uh, th there was another guy called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was a Hungarian obstetrician. He discovered that uh, unwashed hands and unwashed instruments were causing infection. And ostensibly we could have had 30, 40 years of, fewer people dying due to sepsis, but he was such a poor communicator that he was unable to actually get that across to people in a meaningful way. And they just went back to doing things normally, not washing their hands between patients, not, not washing their hands after they inspected, you know, cadavers, you know, and then would go and do pelvic exams on people. And, you know, nowadays we're like, how could they not have known they were spreading disease? But they didn't. So I think, the oh. The role of just being a good communicator is really undervalued. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, you know, with the not washing your hands, with everything that's happening with coronavirus and hand sanitizer every 20 seconds, like the thought of not doing that makes my skin crawl. It's so bad. But even like what you were saying about having that relentlessness is like a part of your... <laughs> you know. Oh, wait, I missed it. What? Sorry, I was making a feeble joke. I said like not doing it literally made other people's skin crawl back in the day. Oh, yeah, it's ugh, it's just bad. And I, I mean, like you think about it now. I have like a little hand sanitizer on my water bottle. There's one in my car. There's one in my room by the door. Everywhere. Like you just can't be too careful now. And now you think back then, these people are just going about not worrying about that at all, which is disgusting. But, you know, you didn't know. There was no microscopic world to them. It, like, it, it wasn't part of their consciousness. The idea they had that no idea. they couldn't see. I mean, oh, they yeah. didn't, even, didn't even compute. Yeah. Oh, I know. There was a quote in the book, and I'm not even going to try to find it. It was like one line, and it talks about, you know, they're so... I mean, they're just willfully, I don't, I don't know what the quote was, but they're just really unaware of all the stuff they don't know. And they're not bothered by it because of course they don't know it. It's like unknown unknowns. I don't know. So. Exactly. still very true. Oh yeah. With bliss. Ignorance is bliss. And sadly today we're still seeing that. So. Oh, I think it's pretty forgiving of people historically because you can't, you can't judge their ignorance based on their current level of knowledge right. because like you go, I don't know, you pick somebody like Aristotle who had all this influence and, but had all these errors. You're like, okay, well, knowing what was available to him at the time, could I have done any better than that? I mean, almost exactly. Like, you know, like it's, you, it's, it's important that you judge people based on the capacities they had at the time, but it's also important that you don't write them a blank check for like whatever bad behavior they did too. I mean, it's, I think even thing I've heard recently is if five you, years, whatever you look back in five years from what's going on today, I mean, masks and hand sanitizers and 
what are we going to look back and say and learn from or say we didn't do this right or we did this right so it's always a continuum well the uh, the coronavirus pandemic has given us plenty of things that we've done wrong to learn from so we can uh, we've got lots of uh Lots of room for growth in terms of how we deal with pandemics after this. But I thought your comment about showmanship was really interesting because we have, um, I, I just recently read a book and it was The Other Einstein and mm -hmm. it's about Einstein's first wife. Oh, wow. And so she apparently sort of was the heavy lift behind the stuff he discovered, but mm -hmm. he was incredibly personable and gregarious. Interesting. And of course yeah. had this and male well yeah but he had this wild hair and she you know even the book you know describes her as some you know a little bit grim and <laughs> but so when he got they ended up there was einstein's second wife too but when he got the nobel prize she had done all the work Ooh. and ah! he gave her the money but not the credit but it was the showmanship mm. aspect of it because he went to present these papers and he was apparently very charismatic and that's what sort of pushed it forward. And so it's interesting that that, and that, I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, not that the law moves at any alarming rate of speed or that anybody wants to talk about it, but that's the way that it is, I think everywhere. And I hadn't thought about it in medicine because I always think in medicine uh -huh. that you have all these people who are, I don't know, way more serious. Um, yeah, but I think uh, you know, like <laughs> you know, that makes sense. We, we always assume science and medicine has this very kind of steady linear progression of you know getting better right. and better. And it and doesn't. Better. And it's, yeah. No, it's it's really fits and starts, and you find you know stasis for a long time, and then massive innovations happen, and suddenly everything. It's like computing. I mean, people were able to live without computers, but as soon as computing became cheap and available, it just changed everything to the point where we don't really. It, it's hard for us to go out our daily life without interacting with a computer system in some way, shape, or form. Whereas prior to that, people did. And, yeah, but, you, know, but you think about your personal health and safety when somebody's going to, you know, touch your body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hopefully. I don't yeah. want to be a science experiment. <laughs> I don't know. I think we're all science experiments in one way, shape, or form. Anytime there's data gathered, you know, yeah. even if it's a retrospective study, they can just say like, okay, well, this was tried and this came out. But I think uh, you just don't want to be an N of one. You don't want to be the, a single case study. <laughs> but it makes yeah. you, when David ran the anesthesia practice, he would say that he got paid for people waking up, yeah. not for going to sleep. I'll buy that. Yeah, and yeah. that really makes you think about yeah. it. That so, sounds awful, but it's sadly true. I mean, they, they would say, yeah, success versus out their bills or something, and I'd say, well, you know, we will we will put you to sleep for free, but you know, it's going to cost you more to wake you up. So, what would you rather happen? Yeah. And then when you said about dying, you know, they do they make you sign, you know, lawyers like me make you sign all these forms, but you know, when you get to the real risk, you know, what David kept telling me, I have a lot of expensive dental work. He's like, don't knock her teeth out. <laughs> It's a real problem with anesthesia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would I would frequently get frequently get people showing up in my office with a tooth in their hand <laughs> and say, "Y'all knock my tooth out," and they'd have you know like maybe three more teeth in their head. And, <laughs> and then I I would go to the release and I would say, "Now we, we saw a, a lot of bad things can happen, including you can die." And you didn't die, so you're ahead of the game. Bye. It's so, a little better than that. Yeah. Well, in the ER, people are upset that they had a bad experience, but the sad quote is, but did you die? Yeah, exactly. You know, anything less than death is okay. Yeah. We don't say that. We don't say that. We don't promote that. But <laughs> somebody else did today, probably. But when yeah. you talk about uh, the, yeah. the discoveries, so Marie Curie, um, the little girls in this town are obsessed, obsessed really? with Marie Curie. Really? We oh, yeah. So much stuff. We sell, that, makes, that makes me happy. We <laughs> sell so much Marie Curie stuff. I mean, a ridiculous amount of Marie Curie books. Did you guys hear that? Studies. But, well, I, don't, I don't know what it is. We love kids. I, I don't know what that is. You might tell, oh, the, you might tell the computer oh, so I'm sorry. we can see you. We, um, we, so Madame Curie. Mary Curie. Mary Curie, who discovered radiation. 
okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Little girls in this town are obsessed with her. Really? Obsessed with her. We sell any kind of book we get on her. I don't even know if we have any in stock. We cannot yeah. keep them in stock. We sell we sell all these stories. And the well, there's our new book club, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so her first the first uh, time that I realized this, a little girl came in, and she had on a pink shirt. She had pink bows in her pigtails, and it had Marie Curie with a little beaker on the front. And mm -hmm. um, so, do you have Marie Curie books? And I'm like, well yeah we do and i went and dug around and i found them and, and i gave them to her and, and then she was so excited and then her mother was like this is perfect this is exactly what we need and i'm like all right you know this doesn't end well i mean you know we all need to know yeah. it doesn't end well before i give your daughter who was you know <laughs> a book about this and she's like oh she knows how it ends it's yeah. fine well there's two nobel there's two nobel prizes in the yeah she was in like the meantime, yeah. she knows how she know, and i get because some you know i don't want to surprise but more, little girls in this town are obsessed. Somewhat. Well, we have a good amount of them. Don't you think, Shay? I think there's a good amount. But it's very interesting, which the interest I had as a kid, uh -huh. which, like, Captain Underpants, like, I read, <laughs> you know, like, a side note, they were in black and white when I was a kid, and now they're in Ooh. color. So when your Ooh. kids come in, I'm like, that's in my thing. <laughs> we don't even know. We had no idea what color George's hair was. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I feel like the accessibility has really grown for kids nowadays versus what I had growing up and I know that I'm the, usually the younger one here in the store to help people find <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah, usually. <laughs> but you know, I just I feel like it's gotten better every generation. So like medical history and just everything in general, like the public knowledge is gonna keep getting better. And it is, but I think we're also seeing, you know, obviously with the pandemic, the, the dark side of that, which is through all of human history, we've been looking for knowledge. We've been looking for we need more info. We need more data. We need to have this. Now we have a new problem as a society. We have so much data. We need to come up with tools to actually parse through it yeah. and pull out the good stuff and separate it from the bad stuff. And I mean, and we're bad at it. I mean, just, you know, I exhibit A, Facebook, like anything you look at, you really have to be skeptical about. And some people are very bad at being skeptical about data. I feel like if I ever see anything on Facebook and I refer to it in a conversation, I say, I read an article on Facebook, not like, I just feel like that's my disclaimer. It is, it should be a disclaimer, yeah. Here's the thing that might be true or might just be appeal to my pre-existing biases and was algorithmically put in front yeah. of me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I was trying to think, there was one other thing. Oh, so. We're, the, you're talking about progress. I think one other thing that can both help and retard progress is medical societies and scientific societies. So you look at the Royal Society in England, things that they did that were amazing in medical societies. But they also were talking about on uh, back to our buddy Jackson was that uh, he was so into the hierarchy of science that the prospect that anything worthwhile could come out of America, his own country, <laughs> was just blew him away. It was like. Uh, you know, Paris was better than Boston. The doctor you trained at was much better than Dr. Jackson. You know, there's just this hierarchy and the fact that a dentist, and by the way, we're talking about how surgeons were low status. Dentists were like untouchables in the medical community at that time. The fact that this dentist could come up with something worthwhile for surgery, just, I think, absolutely just was counter to everything that was right with his world. Like he could not contemplate, uh, a shift in the hierarchy like that. Like it was impossible to him that a dentist, an American dentist at that, could do something that would be so worthwhile in Europe and other places. So I think it's it's really weird. I think it's that rigidity. I think maybe that maybe that's the problem I have with Charles Jackson is he's just such a rigid person. He was unable to bend his expectations or his ideas in any way. And the uh, oh, one follow up. There's a uh, there's an author named Sherwin Newland. He's a uh, he was a medical historian and surgeon. He taught at Yale. He has a version of this story that I've never heard anywhere else, but I like it so much better. I always bring up <laughs> so this in his version of events. Um, Morton died. Was buried in uh, Cambridge. He and it, that's true. He is in Cambridge. But in his version of how this whole thing played out is that years later, Charles Jackson was at a funeral in in Boston and the, it was at the Cambridge uh, um, yeah, it was in Cambridge sorry 
And as he was leaving, he walked past Morton's grave and read the headstone, which basically said, Morton, the revealer and discoverer of anesthesia before whom in all time surgery was agony. And according to Sherwin Moulin, Charles Jackson went acutely insane at that point. It wasn't like a, uh, it wasn't a stroke. It, he just had an acute psychotic episode. Which <laughs> never recovered to see his uh, hated rival so, you know, praised <laughs> on his own tombstone. <laughs> apparently they are buried in the exact same cemetery. I need to get back to Boston. So they're, they're both in Cambridge then? I think so. I think they're both buried in Cambridge. I, I would have liked to have seen the psychotic break. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, I think I, I, it's kind of Sean Freud, but I think I would like to go back in time and see that happen. <laughs> Were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say I have um, some relatives up north, and I think I might have to go make the trip and see the room where the surgery was performed and then, you know, their grave sites. And I definitely do also wish I could see the psychotic break, especially because I don't know if it's just – the way I picture things, but I picture these men as so dignified and so proper with their like old English that anything kind of like psychosis just it seems so out of place. I just would love it. It sounds great. Yes, like, I, I pictured a lot of monocles dropping. <laughs> <laughs> go to Boston. Yeah. Go, go, go to Boston. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you mean Boston? Boston. <laughs> Sorry, this is a northern mis Midwestern accent. Yes, <laughs> my my son Archer pronounces all of his A's and his O's kind of that way. So he's like, I'm Orcha. I'm like you, you are not a Kennedy. Why do you talk like that? <laughs> 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 hey, Dad, go to Boston. You gotta get the claw. <laughs> That's the best. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, uh, so it, on the off chance you get there. Uh, go to the, the go to Harvard Medical School, and you can actually go in and just you know you don't have to like uh, have an appointment. But there is a medical history museum at Harvard, and in there they have one of the original ether inhalation devices. Now it sounds awesome. It's the Harvard Medical History Museum. It's literally the hallway of an office building. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was but thinking. It sounds really good. But, <laughs> but the thing is, it, it, what's crazy though, it is really good in that it's just the hallway of a building, but. They've got that ether inhalation device. We also have Phineas Gage's skull and the tamping rod that shot through his head. And this wasn't in the book at all, but Phineas Gage it was a railroad worker who, you know, had his tamping rod hit some un, um, kind of un um, insulated gunpowder, and his tamping rod shot through his head, destroyed one of his frontal lobes, but he survived. But he's the guy who had an injury that let us figure out how the brain actually segregates different functions. And they have his skull and the tamping rod in a case oh in the Medical History Museum at Harvard. So, so yeah, I, I'm making fun of it. That didn't happen Boston. though in Boston. It's right there. Yeah. What's that? His injury didn't happen in Boston, correct? It was. Um, it, it kind of the, the rod kind of went here through the eye socket and out the top of the head, so it destroyed his frontal lobe on the left. And it's just shocking. Like, a he survived that, and he didn't get an infection that killed him afterward but he I, had, you know, I, remember, he, I remember learning about that like in fifth sixth grade history so i didn't know where his actual where did you take your fifth grade where history did you take <laughs> fifth grade history <laughs> <Maybe Wisconsin? laughs> hey wisconsin thumbs up <laughs> yeah yeah i remember learning about in um advanced placement psychology when we were learning about the brain so now i'm Definitely going because that sounds. I want to see that school. That sounds really cool. Yeah, you can just go to Harvard Medical School and you can just, just ask them to go see the museum and they'll be like, oh, yeah, third floor. Or I forget which floor it is, but I've been there a couple times. It's awesome. Yeah. So they just have the skull and the. Well, it's in a case. But well, yeah, yeah, it's in a I case. <laughs> there's, there's also a death cast of Phineas Gage. Like they have a plaster cast of him, you know, uh, shortly after death. So you can see the flap on the, you know, of his head where the camping rod shot through. And then go to the north end and get some cannolis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say, yeah. So that's Is an it, accidental discovery. I'm trying to, yeah, I don't have a go-to food in Boston. I really should. Cannolis uh, at Mike's in the north end. Hmm. I was going to say Mike's pastries is the one thing that I do like about 
that I know well and like a lot about Boston is Mike's oh, pastries. Like I know about the secret Philly sandwich. It's not the cheesesteak, it's the chicken and broccoli sandwich, but I don't know about the Boston cannoli, so okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. And beignets in New Orleans, obviously. That's gotta go for that. Got pepperoni rolls here. Pepperoni yeah. rolls, yeah. Actually, yeah. Connor, where are you from? I am from Tampa, Florida. So I don't know. Cuban food maybe from there is kind of special if you think about like no, all those people. I was gonna say, yeah, just when you get offered a pepperoni roll, say yes because people will be offended if you say no. Yeah, well, actually, uh, my longtime boyfriend, his family lives a little bit outside of Boston. Well, a little bit, an hour outside of Boston. So I've been there to visit a few times, and I have relatives in the area as well. So it all kind of works out. But um, definitely the pepperoni roll is something to try. Mike's pastry is very good. But now I'm, like, very excited to see the Harvard, like, the Medical History Museum. I think that I think that'll, I'll make that a priority the next time I go visit. It's really cool. I'm excited. You know, when we do this again, feel free to come to the bookstore. We have plenty of space here. Yeah, we're, we're relatively close here because there's very few of us, but uh, we can spread out as needed as well if you guys are in, in town. And hopefully in six to eight weeks, we'll actually not be in as dire a situation as we are now. Or maybe it'll be worse. That's what's <laughs> <saying. Yeah. laughs> The first one of these we actually did was uh, completely virtual, and it still worked out okay. So... Just uh, FYI, so the first book we did was this one. It's called The Ghost Map. And it's actually about a pandemic and how people actually figured out that disease was spread by, you know, water. Yeah, by could be spread by water. And it was uh, one of the first death knells in the miasma theory of disease. So not that you have extra homework, but it's a nice little pandemic reading, uh, reading assignment for anybody. <laughs> There's been a lot of interest in pandemics right now. Yeah. You don't have anything else to do. <laughs> Well, what's sad is I like I love history and medical history in particular, but I really don't know much about the 1918 or the Spanish flu. Well, that was actually yeah. whenever we had the first shutdown, the great um, pan- influenza. The great influenza was our bestseller, and then the plague by Albert <laughs> Jeez. Um, and then the ghost map was pretty popular, oh. even if they didn't participate in the book club. It was still a we good seller. We did sell quite a few. All so right. I think it is a growing interest with science. Cool. As long as we keep moving the books to the store. I want to yeah, keep right? Yeah, we, want to, we want you guys to stay open. <laughs> well, I, I, and I do think yeah. that people, we do really appreciate it. And I think that people are, are, I mean, I think people in this area at least are interested in the science. They're not just interested in, the, you know, whatnot, but they're interested in the science yeah. and trying to understand what it is is going on. Yeah, it's, and it, I think, it's a lot of fun with medical history. It's both shocking and informative, and you can kind of just keep going deeper yeah, and deeper with it. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's very interesting. And I think as medical students and you know, as a, you know, healthcare professionals, the more you know about the history, it doesn't necessarily change how you practice, but I think it gives you a little more resiliency in terms of your own, you know, well-being. It just gives you a better perspective on how things have developed, how they work, what's dysfunctional, why it's dysfunctional, how it could be better. And a lot of times, it, you know, despite our reading assignment today with, you know, three out of four people being completely dysfunctional in some way, there are, there are very praiseworthy people involved. In fact, you know, so next time, if you guys are willing to participate again after this fun, the, this one, the butchering art, the uh, main person in that, Joseph Lister, he's, he's one of the few people in medical history who can be like, this is just a good person. Like, very driven, but not at the expense of anybody else. Very humble, but not to the point where he's going to let a significant discovery be ignored. Like it's, he's just one of the few people you'd be like, okay, this is just somebody who was the right person at the right time and just a solid human being. So, is he Mr. Listerine? He, uh, he is not Mr. Listerine in that he didn't create Listerine, oh, okay. but he's named in his <laughs> honor. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> Oh, oh no! The puppy figured out how to knock down the uh, the boxy dog treats. <laughs> Problem solving accomplished. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, um, I might have to join you in the bookstore for the next book club, especially if Harper is gonna be there because Harper. she's think, just too Harper. cute. Harper, <laughs> and we have pizza and wine. Uh, yeah, pizza yeah. wine. <laughs> we'll be here every day. The students who doesn't do the books. 
She's always welcome. <laughs> okay, now we That's should be a puppy. Does anybody have a cat or a dog to yeah. show us? Yeah, you have a dog. So we'll just say he's on the floor. Here we go. Baby getting more dogs than babies with that one usually. Yes. <laughs> See if I can do this a little bit. Okay. So while they're doing that, getting their puppy, I will, I don't, I had to leave my dog at home. It was very, very sad. She's my bestie. But she, oh. this is, this is her. She's, I, I can't know. She's rolling around in the grass and just stretching. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is the most so, Australian shepherd I have ever seen. That, that is like the. <laughs> she's actually a mutt. She's a mix. We don't know who, what other dog is she's mixed with, but um, yeah, her, she's just, she's just too sweet. I don't know. I'm very, you know. And you're you biased, have, obviously, but that's all right. And y'all have something bit. laying on the floor there. Yeah. What's that? You have something laying on the floor. You're sure that wasn't a stuffed animal? I know, right? No, oh, he's, he's pretty content. I know. He's pretty <laughs> he packs them out, so. Yeah. Cool. But uh, there, 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 anybody else, did, did anybody have any kind of other insights or stuff that they thought was kind of strange, noteworthy, or interesting about the book? I think. Uh, We've hit a lot of the high points, kind of bounced around, but I think this is one of the few books where I've got lots of liner notes in it with, <laughs> yeah, just to, to, to say, like, right here, what an asshole. <laughs> one of the few books oh. that are obligated to write something like those lines. <laughs> like, I feel like I definitely annotate a lot of the books I read mostly just because I feel that everything is important and I also have kind of a bad memory and writing really helps me. So I am full of notes and stuff as well. Oh, okay. But one of the things on page 35 that I like kind of looked at as not, you know, something to take away from the book was that langor. And I had to look up what that word meant because I did not know is the bane of intellect. And on the next page, um, Dr. Bedos, unsure about that pronunciation, yeah. decided that langor was also the bane of public health. So basically, you know, just being really tired and very content, it, you know, it's not going to help you get farther ahead. It's not going to, you know, help make advancements in the medical medical community, you know, in this context. So I, I want to like write that on my bathroom mirror. I felt like that was pretty impactful, <laughs> but also, you know, goes to speak to the, like the showmanship personality and how you have to be relentless in the pursuit of these breakthroughs. So I, I really appreciated that. And I circled it and I had to write the definition in the margin because, you know, some of these words, I just really, they're, they're older words. I didn't really know how they, you know, played into it, but I really like that. So the the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one I could, you know, through context clues, I was able to figure out, but. Not for Charles know. Dickens and uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. I'd really doubt Humbug would be right? Uh, one of the information. Right, right. I laughed when I saw it in this book. I was at the vet with her actually and they took her inside and I was reading it. I was like, Humbug. <laughs> so on the, the next page actually it's 37 i have a section underlined because uh we're talking about how ether had been around and no one had used it for surgery and same for nitrous and so it's like in in 1800 humphrey davy collected what he knew about nitrous oxide in a widely read book that said that he cited his experiences with insensibility under its influence which made him suggest that in retrospect nitrous oxide may probably be used with advantage during surgical operations that's like 50 years before the ether day. I'm like, come on. Like he, he put it in a widely read book. Like it's, you're, you're right. It's just people, it's right there in their face the whole time and no one actually bothered to try. <laughs> oh, I know. And I think there was even a line later on in the chapter or maybe in the, I don't know, but it had talked about how a lot of these surgeons performing these procedures had this book on their bookshelf and they just like, it was so it was right there it was just very frustrating but you know i guess you know what they say hindsight is twenty twenty. you never know until you know i don't know i've got a lot of unread books on my bookshelf i'm not gonna throw stone <laughs> oh i do <laughs> but i don't know excellent pick i really like this book and i'm looking forward to the butchering art because yeah it's i mean this book is really good but i'll tell you the butchering art it's even more readable Lin Lindsay fitzharris she if, if you follow anybody on uh, social media, she's pretty fun because she has a lot of medical history themed stuff on YouTube and uh, 
uh, stuff on Twitter, and she's working on her second book now. I don't know what it's about. It's another medical history book. Is she obviously. a doctor? She, no, she is a uh, medical historian, okay. like uh, trained as such. But uh, yeah, she, she's just funny. That's, yeah. She's good friends with the Raven Keeper at the Tower of England. Uh, the, oh, yeah. The Tower yeah. of London, part of yeah. me, So, yeah. Oh, that's funny. The Tower of London and Tower of England. Yeah, Tower of England's just bigger. <laughs> yeah, it, so it's a lot of fun. And uh, it's really the second part that bookends this one. Because now we've got surgical anesthesia, but the rate of post-surgical sepsis was still just unacceptably terrible. So people still would postpone surgery until it was absolutely that or dying. And actually, uh, one they mentioned it early on in the book, but one of the procedures that people had to undergo a lot during medical history was getting uh, a lithotomy to remove kidney stones that became mm -hmm. bladder stones. And if you know anything about anatomy, you might think, oh, well... So if you cut above the pubic bone, you can get to the bladder that way and maybe take the, take the stone out. And that's still terrible, but you could think about that. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. No, no, stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's not how people cut for the stone. It was the perineal approach, meaning they got put up in stirrups and they went between the genitalia and, the anus, and they just cut in and stuck their fingers in, rooted around until they felt the stone, clamped onto it, pulled it out, and then just kind of hoped everything healed up okay. Oh, and I especially love how they included that illustration too <laughs> in the book. I was like, oh god. And it was yeah. I was like, oh wow. And they had talked about how you like you wanted the best surgeon for that procedure, like you the in and out, and like what they say, like a few minutes. And I was like, well, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, like what the consequences are of you know, letting that condition, like the bladder stone kind of fester and like leave a B. But I think I maybe would have opted for that because this looks gruesome. Oh, I just did not like that. Well, thing, it was death. So people's kidneys would eventually shut down because the stone would take up too much space. Urine couldn't get into the bladder anymore. So oh. they would die. The, uh, my, my favorite author is a guy named Neil Stevenson. He writes really dense historical fiction I, and sci-fi. He's awesome. But, uh, in one of his books, he had a uh, description of that procedure, and the main character was dying of a bladder stone, and he'd seen the procedure, and he was unwilling to go through with it, and so he was dying of a bladder stone, and they threw him a big party to celebrate, you know, celebrate his life, because then he was going to die, but at the end of the party, he was so drunk that they basically trussed him up and did the <laughs> operation on him, <laughs> and, you know, because it's historical fiction, it's all famous people, so it was Robert Hooke, a uh, famous... British uh, natural philosopher at the time and, and he basically was talking to him like yeah you you've been a great help to me throughout my life and now I will be a great help to you even though you will not thank me for it and like, but, I'm, but he said I'm the person who's best suited to do this in the entire world and I'll do it as quickly as I can so yeah I mean surgery yeah. was all about speed and these days it's kind of intriguing that speed's good that's not what the mark of an excellent surgeon is anymore although actually you guys might weigh in because I think you know patient volume is always creeping in as a uh, consideration, but an excellent surgeon is not somebody with the most, the speediest procedure. It's the person with the best hopeful survival outcomes and less morbidities. Well, you so, know, when David had his quadruple bypass. Ooh. <laughs> quadruple, wow. Okay. Yeah, I guess yeah, he so. had his quadruple bypass, which was a long, like almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so we were in East Tennessee and went to the hospital there and with his heart attack and then they did the um what is the thing the what? thing where they put the thing the camera intubate no 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 the thing the thing the diagnostic thing oh yeah the, the, yeah. Yeah. Put the camera up and yeah the and thing yeah. what's it no, i can't even think of the name anyway um they did the thing and they said oh you know there are there are all these block bypasses we have to do a quadruple bypass and then they said, well, you know, it was, this was a Friday or Saturday. We can do it Monday. Okay. Well, you know, to me, I'm like, well, why are we waiting? Couldn't we get busy now? No, 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 no. This can all calm down. It's all going to be fine. And so uh, one of my clients, his wife supervises a residence at the hospital. Mm. And they said, you know, Dr. Myers was the surgeon that did his bypass. And so I called her and I was like, 
you know, do we need to go to Atlanta? I mean, we're sort of in East Tennessee. Do I need to get out of here? Do I need to go to a bigger hospital? What is it I need to do? And she was like, no, he's outstanding. We just got him. We recruited him. And she said, he's a speedball. He's going to get in. He's going to get out. And there's not much time on the pump. And that's wow. really important in this procedure. Okay. And so she said, so, you know, and I mean, it's taken. I mean, Dr. So Meyer, far. Yeah, so far. It's been like 20 years. 20 years. That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 And there's been two little blips in the interim, but this is okay. Um, but yeah, she did. She did say, and, well, and he well, was. sleeping puppy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I don't know where the sleeping puppy is. Um, but she did say that he was, uh, that, 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 you know, you don't want, you don't want somebody pokey. <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting when you were saying that about speed, because that was, you know, I mean, if this is 20 years ago. So it's still so, a selling point though. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and she said he was really good. He had trained at Hopkins and at Duke and, you know, cool. and everything else. And, I don't know. Although when he came to talk to David, here's a bedside manner tip for you. Oh, you're not a, <laughs> you're not a yeah. yeah. Here, uh, here's your bedside manner tip. So when David was in the hospital and they came to say that Dr. Myers would do the surgery on Monday and Dr. Myers came in to say here. And then we were chit chatting with him to get to know him. And he let us know that his hobby was woodworking. And I'm like, all right, you're a surgeon. And you're going to do woodworking. Don't cut your finger off this weekend. <laughs> this hand, seems like, you, know, hand, so. <laughs> you know, so you might not want to like describe hobbies that could hurt your <laughs> further surgery. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, as long as he has all, all five fingers in each hand for the procedure. Well, and he yeah. did, and it was fine, but he was like, oh, I'm going to do some woodworking in, this weekend. And we're like, really? We're going to be sitting in the hospital. <laughs> Use the small hammer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, last time we did this, we actually kind of went around and did a little, uh, kind of a little wrap up, but also some idea gathering for other books. So we've set the next one, you know, the butchering art, but were there other books or other topics that people were interested in or any particular area that you wanted to kind of branch off of? Because I wanted to make sure we don't uh, preclude other options later on. I think her name's Mary Roach. She's written six, yeah. and she, I tend to like her stuff. And then I feel like a classic is The Immortal Life of Henry the Last. I, I have not read that. It's I've, a I've had oh, it it's very good. It's the first yeah. science based book, like the you know, history that I've read, and it really makes you question ethics the mm -hmm. whole way through. Oh, yeah. So it's I think really that's good. a worthwhile mm -hmm. read. I did not watch the movie or documentary that Oprah did, but it really does make you question, like, the I'm ethics. I didn't, even brought know, up I didn't know there was a documentary. Okay. Yeah, Oprah did a thing on it, but uh, the book is great. The documentary is interesting, and it just makes you really think about the immortal life. Yeah, it, it, it is. Because, like, I never considered medical ethics or just, like, is this good for the patient or bad? I just, you know, I just never thought about it until I read that book and said, oh, my God. The cancer cells being taken without permission, and but all the advancements out of it, you yeah. know, it's. it's a, yeah, that, that type of is something that's always been there. Like, what at what cost do you take the advancements? And I think uh, one of you guys was uh, nodding your head. So have you read the book? Or I've heard the story. The I've story, seen. I've not yeah. read the book, though, yeah. So I, I would enjoy that. I did read excerpts of the book um, in a class that I took in undergrad, and it was very insightful. And, you know, I, I don't know if it was just, the you know, the manipulation of the text for the class's, you know, purposes, but it also, you know, like, Henrietta Lacks was a black woman and that I think kind of played into the part of why they were felt they were entitled to her, her body parts herself. So I would be interested in, you know, what with everything going on in the world aside from coronavirus, you know, understanding more about the history kind of in medical disparities. I don't know what kind of books there are available to that, but I think it might be a good resource, you know, going forward as Student yeah. physicians. It's my, it's my staff pick. It's, yeah. it's oh, Shay's yeah. staff yeah. pick. So we have, we have, we have a, we have a, there you go, Shay. Yeah. You get to post your book. Very nice. It's a great book. From what I, the little pieces that I did read, I really enjoyed it. It was a great story. Last time too, so I think that one's going to make the short list to the. Uh, I would definitely reread yeah. it. Like I think it's. You question I would it the first time too. around, and you read it a second time. And you're it's like, it's really disturbing. Okay. 
<laughs> I mean, I'm sure this is also that a very disturbing. Thing. Thing. <laughs> yeah, you're taking me out of my comfort zone. I'm good with disturbing blood and guts, not, <laughs> not disturbing societal implications. But no, absolutely. I think we can totally put that one in there. So uh, bringing up, uh, branching off of that, uh, being an anatomist, there's a lot of bad history in anatomy with, you know, you know, there was obviously body snatching. That's going to be mm -hmm. something that gets talked about in the butchering art. But uh, on top of that, in the Nazi era, there was an anatomy atlas that was produced called the Krumkopf Atlas. It was made in Germany, and it was amazing for the time. It was the best atlas available. The pictures were works of art, all the perspectives, all the rational, or just all the, the views, the relationships were all excellent. But they were done on dissections from concentration camp victims. So once that became known, it was just people were a horrified, but also it was the best atlas out there. So what the, the confusion was, well, do you not use it or do you still refer, refer to it? I mean, surgeons would use it as a reference to prepare for difficult surgeries. Thankfully, now there are much better references available. We don't have that same ethical conundrum daily, but the fact that something useful came from such a horrible source was a real problem. And a lot of Nazi science had that same thing going on. You look at rockets, a lot of histology. I mean, there's a, there's a group of cells called uh, Clara cells that are in the lungs. You guys ever heard of those? They're, it's, they're called Clara cells, but the guy who described them, Max Clara, was a Nazi scientist who worked on concentration camp victim, you know, tissues. So, you know, first off, we don't. We try to not call them car cells, but a lot of people don't even know that that's the background of that what name. They are. Yeah. yeah. So it's in terms of uh, not only willingness to be part of a procedure in the case of Henry elapse and a lack of consultation. Mm -hmm. There's also just pure victim, you know, victimizing people and profiting off of their their misery or their death. It's it's bad, but ignoring it's worse yeah. well ignoring it is worse because then you don't know how to deal with it but mm -hmm. yeah henry of the lacks it's a great book i hadn't even thought about that today but yeah it's wonderful there you go staff pick for the week yeah <laughs> cool any other topics that you guys would want to uh, maybe explore later on and please come to the store we'll be good we'll socially distance we'll wear masks we'll be, we'll be yes good. we can push the tables apart we have a wine bar that we one day want to open and get licensed and uh but We'll have pizza, we'll have wine. And, and everybody can occupy the dog so she doesn't chew the shells. And there we go. <laughs> and regarding pizza, I think you need to have an in at the Humble Tomato. You need to have some sort yeah. of an inside yeah. scoop. But, uh, well, if only we had someone who worked there. Mm. <laughs> Is there a date for the next book? I haven't set the date yet. I wanted to kind of, actually, since you guys are here, you get, uh, you get pride of place. So uh, in terms of reading a book, what with medical school starting back up and work and everything else, what seems like a reasonable timeline? Not to, and again, if you don't read the book, I don't want anyone avoiding the session out of shame. <laughs> a reasonable time to get slash make a make a little bit of a, a foray into the book. Um, I was thinking six to eight weeks. It's not that big. You're going to read a lot. We can go six to eight weeks, but yeah, no problem. Yeah, yes. I'd love to talk about it as soon as possible, but I don't want to give you guys a week turnaround. And, you know, yeah. I don't know. Well, that sounds reasonable. Six weeks? Perfect. Perfect. What do you think, Connor? Um, you know, I, I think that would be great. Obviously, I don't know what the demands of medical school is going to be and how much free time I'll be afforded to read, but I think six weeks would be more than plenty. Cool. So. And remember, the expectation here is minimal. It's a, no one has to finish the book. If you just want to hang out for the discussion, it's all good. And, but this is one when you start, it's, it's pretty compelling. For the wine and the conversation. Cheers. Right. <laughs> yeah, and come on down. That would be August the 28th. I'll have to check my schedule, but I think. And see what you think? Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. That's the Friday before. It's not the Friday before Labor Day. It's the mm. Friday before the Friday before Labor oh. Day. Did you say August 28th? 28th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate uh, re your reading Ether Day in part or in whole and mm -hmm. just engaging in it. So, uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing you guys again. I get uh, I get the second years right away, like literally the first class. Yeah. Oh, embryology, right? Embryology of the heart. 
Yes, oh. heart and lung embryology. Oh, it's sound. I'm previewing a little bit. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I previewed a little bit, and I'm. I'm. It's not my favorite topic. I'll be honest. No, it's. It, it took a. It took a long time for it to become one of my favorite topics. I had to. Actually, to put up, I had to create like three YouTube videos before I actually felt like I knew what I was talking about. It was complicated. That's that's my way of understanding things deeply. I actually have to make a video about it. You're like, okay, if I can explain this in a way that visually and audi audibly makes sense to me, then I can actually think I know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. And first years, you get me relatively early. I'm going to be the first anatomy lecture, so about at the end of the foundations course. Very nice. Very excited. So hopefully not at the low ebb of energy after the <laughs> slight upward angle right there. <laughs> On the recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be good. Into the anatomy lab, even with the pandemic, it's going to be way different, but we're going to, we're going to get you in there regardless. It'll be good. Yeah. Very good. And all of our donors are people who volunteered to be there as a benefit to humanity uh, with full informed consent. So again, mm -hmm. medical history, better than it had, been, better than it has been. Perfect. Very good. Well, thank you for hosting. This is really exciting. I'm really pleased I participated. Thank you. Like, I hope you guys had a good time. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's something it's weird because sometimes I feel like, am I just blathering on about something I think is interesting and these poor yeah. people agreed to sit in and everything? <laughs> That's the most work I think. Cool. So I love just sitting here. Like, I really do. I love the conversation and Please talking. Come to so the Please oh. come to the store and sit with us. And of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm afraid to hear what you said, though. Yes. <laughs> oh, we didn't actually hear what you said earlier, though. Sorry. Yes, we can bring wine to the store, you said, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they seem to be happy with that story. <laughs> All right. I will see everybody uh, in the classroom sooner or later, <laughs> and I'll see you hopefully here in six weeks or so. All righty. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. And again, thanks for letting me get dressed up. I feel, I feel like myself again. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice, yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, hey. Medical school would be so daunting. It, it's tough. I mean, law school and med school, they're, no, they're no. considered equivalently no, 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 uh, no, no. demanding. Law school is, see, David disagrees with me, but I will say law school is drudgery. Mm. There's so much drudgery. It's just a huge quantity of information. I did. I felt like if you could memorize, what is she doing? She's just burying her hand. <laughs> Maybe there's a cool spot back there. Yeah, I think it's a cool on her nose. She's just getting some of the ribs in the hole. Is there an AC vent back there? Or? No, they're all at top. Yeah. I have no idea.